How you doing? Uh, you're all very welcome here tonight to a very special commemoration from the Trasna Tira Lecture Series, remembering not only the 100th anniversary of the death of Sean Tracy, but also most importantly, his life as well. We have numerous contributions from local historians, relatives, great musicians too. Uh, my name is Marcus Howard of Easter Rising Stories. I've made three documentaries on the life of Sean Tracy, Dan Breen, Seamus Robinson and Sean Hogan. And in recent months, we've seen renewed interest in the life and times of Sean Tracy with new books such as Searching for, for Sean by Dan Jack and Neve Hassett, as well as Killing Out's Very Extreme by Derek Molyneux and Darren Kelly. Uh, due to the ever-changing lockdown restrictions, we cannot hold our traditional gathering on Tabot Street, which was originally planned. And if you've ever been to them, they're amazing events. Uh, Tabot Street is also where people from Tipperary would gather when Tipperary are in the GAA All-Ireland Final before going to Crow Park. So did you think we were going to let a virus get in the way of us remembering this important centenary event of Irish history? You must be kidding. No way. Sure, didn't they kickstart the War of Independence themselves in the middle of the second wave of the Spanish flu in Ireland? So the very least we could do is have an online commemoration. So you're all very welcome to this special event tonight, which looks at Sean Tracy's singular contribution to the cause of Irish freedom. Uh, the person that I'm going to introduce to you now is Kathleen Ailish Tracy, who's a relative, oh, Kathleen Ailish Cleary, sorry, who's a relative of Sean Tracy, whom I have had the pleasure of knowing for the past four years. She's often been central to the organization of numerous commemorative events regarding the history of Sean Tracy. She has also taken around most of the graveyards of Tipperary with one of Tipperary's finest historians, John Hassett, who is sadly now passed on. Kathleen is chairperson of the Friends of Sean Tracy group. Kathleen, you're very, very welcome. Thank you, Marcus. Um... Tarkhan Kamaran and Ogla, this Cardi Sean of Tresic, a Queen of Ushla, Kaden Yellowfall Ten Doc, this Tashulagum, Kumaki Shea, Tanab Asaniha. Good evening, everyone, on behalf of the relatives of Sean Tracy and friends of Sean Tracy and Kamaran and Ogla, I hold a great sense of pride to all of my family over the years to have been related to Sean Tracy. We're here to commemorate the life of one of Ireland's most famous and highly regarded songs. Sean was an Irish language enthusiast and an Irish speaker, and his preference was always to sign his name as Gaelge, Sean O'Tracy. Each year since, since Sean's death, his life and untimely passing has been commemorated at his burial place in Kilfika. He was commemorated in Talbot Street on the morning of the All-Ireland Senior Hurling Final when Tipperary participated. The commemorations in Kilfiga were first carried out by his comrades and friends in the Tipperary Brigade Old IRA Commemoration Committee. As the years passed by, the mantle passed to their relatives and to other Republican-minded people on the committee to keep the flame of Sean Tracy's memory alive. This year by right should have been the being the centenary marked by the Third Tiberi Brigade Commemoration Committee with the major celebration of Sean's life in Kilfika, but in line with the annual events they host each year without fail. Sadly, the COVID cars intervened and eventually uh, events had to be scaled back. A small but dignified commemoration was held last weekend and I represented the family and laid a wreath there. The memorial column in the local newspapers last weekend carried the anniversary of Sean's 100th years uh, of his death. This was a touch, this will touch the hearts of a lot of Tipperary people. We in Camorra, Lenoglock, and friends of Sean Tracy, in association with Tras and Atir, felt that in recognition of Sean's life and deeds, it would be good to host a commemoration that could transcend COVID regulations and allow people from everywhere to remember and honour Sean. While Tiberi people hold Sean dear, we are conscious that he is an iconic figure for Republicans, not just in the 32 counties of Ireland, but across the globe where Irish people are gathered. I presented Sean Tracy's violent Brew Culture Centre at the foot of the Rock of Cashel in its public permanent in its on public permanent display. Finbar English will play for us tonight the ballad of Sean Tracy in slow air. Finbar was born and educated in England. He joined a Camorthus branch 
to learn music. And when he heard the ballad of Sean Tracy there, he took a great liking to him. He returned to Ireland, he joined Brugru Cultural Centre, and he was the first to play Sean Tracy's violin there. Sean Tracy's violin has been played by other musicians on special occasions. It's ironic that there's a hurling team in London that carries the name Sean Tracy. Considering that Sean was arrested in, in Tipperary Town and sentenced to six month imprisonment in prison in Dundalk jail for carrying a hurley. The Sean Tracy hurling team in London, under the chairmanship of Adrian Mulcanoff, have a special commemorative event this weekend. They had a minute silence before the game in his honour. They commissioned a jersey with his picture on it and the club is doing very well. Adrian said yesterday they won their game in the Intermediate Hurling Championship beating Crew Collins 417 to 10 points at right slip. My daughter Elaine was honoured to be invited to meet with the team and share her knowledge of the life and times of Sean Tracy as a close relative of his. She gave them an insight into his life and the commitment he gave for Ireland's freedom, describing his passion and tireless commitment to fighting for Ireland. A few months ago, I asked Daniel Jack if he would give the oration in Talbot Street this October for the centenary commemoration and at the suggestion of Neve Hassad, I say. And from there, they took to write a book. First, it was a small publication, and then it turned into a real book. And now it's ready for publication called Searching for Sean. Thank you, Neve and Daniel, for your great effort and research done. This commemoration allows us to remember, discuss and celebrate Sean with friends from all corners of the world. His time in Dublin is remembered tonight through the commemoration held this week on Talbot Street at 4.15 p.m., the time of Sean's death, when he fell for Ireland. We will show footage taken on the same day at his home in Solhead Bay, where we laid a wreath in his memory. We read the proclamation and recited a decade of the rosary, surrounded by members of his surviving family. We have speakers here tonight from across the country, with people turning in from Australia, America and England. Sean's life may have ended in the struggle for our independence, but his memory will continue to burn brightly and fiercely in the minds of Irish Republicans, while ever we continue to gather to pay, to pay tribute to him. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, Kevin Brennan is next, and he's going to be reading Ireland's 1916 proclamation on Talbot Street at the location where Sean Tracy died. So we'll just play a video now. Irish men and Irish women, in the name of God and all of the dead generations from which she receives her old traditions of nationhood, Ireland, through us, summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. Having organised and trained her manhood through her secret revolutionary organisation, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and through her open military organisations, the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Arts Army, having patiently perfected her discipline, having resolutely waited for the right moment to reveal herself, she now seizes that moment and, supported by her exiled children in America and by gallant allies in Europe, but relying in the first on her own strength, she strikes in full confidence of victory. We declare the right of the, of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible. The long usurpation of that right by a foreign people and government has not extinguished the right, nor can it ever be extinguished except by the destruction of the Irish people. In every generation, the Irish people have asserted their right to the national freedom and sovereignty. Six times during the past 300 years, they have asserted it in arms. Standing on that fundamental right, and again asserting it in arms in the face of the world, we hereby proclaim 
the Irish Republic as a sovereign independent state and we pledge our lives and the lives of our comrades in arms to the cause of its freedom, of its welfare and of its exaltation among the nations. The Irish Republic is entitled to and hereby claims the allegiance of every Irish man and Irish woman. The Republic guarantees religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens and declares its resolve to pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation and of all its parts, cherishing all the children of the nation equally and oblivious of the differences carefully fostered by an alien government which have divided a minority from the majority in the past. Until our arms have brought the opportune moment for the establishment of a permanent national government, representative of the whole people of Ireland and elected it by the suffrages of all our men and women, the provisional government hereby constituted will administer the civil and military affairs of the Republic in trust for the people. We place the cause of the Irish Republic under the protection of the Most High God whose blessing we invoke upon our arms and we pray that no one who serves that cause will dishonour it by cowardice, inhumanity or rapine. In this supreme hour, the Irish nation must by its valour and discipline and by the readiness of its children to sacrifice themselves for the common good, prove itself worthy of the august destiny to which it is called. Signed on behalf of the Provisional Government, Thomas J. Clark, John McDermott, Thomas McDonough, P. H. Pierce, Eamon Kiant, James Connolly and Joseph Duncan. Now, you've got the best seat in the house to watch this, okay, so we did a great job, Kevin did. Uh, Dan Jack is our keynote speaker tonight, and we'll be delivering a 10-minute speech on freedom fighter Sean Tracy. Like I say, he's just published a book on the life of Sean Tracy, along with Neve Hassett, called Searching for Sean, Remembering Sean Tracy 100 Years On. Uh, Neve, his co-author, is operating behind the scenes, operating all the videos that you're seeing tonight. Um, Dan hails from the Clonard area in Belfast. He's a family connection to South Tipperary Brigade. His relative is OC Seamus Robinson, who came originally from the Clonard area. This linkage led Dan to write Citizen uh, Soldier, a biography of Robinson, which is a fantastic book on a man who really should be as popular and famous as the likes of Tracy and Breen, in my opinion, as he fought alongside them in many battles. Um, so Dan, you're very, very welcome tonight. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, Akarja, I'll just start by saying that it has been said that a nation reveals itself not only in the people it produces, but also in the people it honours and the people that it remembers. So in that spirit, we gather tonight, albeit virtually, to commemorate the life of John Tracy on the 100th anniversary of his death. It's a great honour for me to make this address. It's more an honour to Vey and Shaw and that. Some commemorators or commentators of late have expressed the opinion that we should not remember our heroes of the past, that we should not remember people like Sean Tracy or William O'Connell, who was killed engaging British forces in Dublin on the same day. Nor indeed should we remember Kevin Barry or the agonising sacrifices of Terence McSweeney or Michael Fitzgerald. I respectfully disagree and firmly believe that we should remember them and that we actually owe a debt of gratitude to people from past generations. The very least that we, the people of today, can give to the men and women of yesteryear is respect. We should remember, we do remember, as Kevin Lynn. It has also been stated over many years that we should not mythologize the people from the past. I believe that we do not need to destroy the people of the past in the midst of lore. In my eyes, what makes them great is the simple and undeniable fact 
that they were ordinary men and women who did extraordinary things. They were flesh and blood like you and I. They had their faults and failings. They lived and loved. They were happy. They were sad. They worked and toiled. But most importantly, they arose to the challenges of their time. Making difficult choices, they took tough decisions and carried out painful deeds that were contrary to their past beliefs. Their actions cost them dearly, be it with their lives or the physical and mental scars they carried with them for the rest of their days. Armed with shotguns, with rusty weapons from bygone days, with rifles seized from their enemy, they faced the might of the world's foremost empire. With a wealth of assets, including a formidable military and a professional administration, the struggle against British rule seemed impossible. But people like Sean Tracy did something unprecedented. From hopelessness, they brought hope. The hope of freedom, the hope of an Irish Republic that would cherish all children of the nation equally, affording rights and opportunities long denied. Through a popular but poorly resourced insurgency, a collective effort by ordinary people using military, political, social and economic pressure, they brought the British to the negotiating table. John Tracy did not live to face the next challenge placed before the fledgling Irish Republic. He drew his last breath fighting enemy agents on a cold, wet Thursday afternoon in Dublin. During my exploration of the life of 3rd Brigade OC Seamus Robinson, many people shone forth from that period. Their bravery, dedication and fortitude to achieve their ideal of an Irish Republic was evident and none shone more brightly than Sean Tracy. We often think of him as a one-dimensional character, that of the militant Irish Republic, Republican, the brave freedom fighter. Of course he was that, and that is why we remember him tonight. He was indeed daring and courageous. He did possess a singular focus to put Ireland above all. However, he reached his destination, not in an overnight journey, but through a life voyage that included relationships, experiences, his own thoughts, choices, and decisions. John Tracy was born on the 14th of February, 1895, in Bellahead Beg, to Dennis and Bridget Tracy. He lost his father at a young age, and no doubt that death had an impact on his young life. Not having the influence of a father can be challenging for a boy. Nevertheless, he was close to his mother's people, the Alice family, and for a time he lived with them in Holyford. On returning to Salahead Beg, he would become close to some young people in the locality, like his cousin Annie Tracy and neighbour Katie Coffey. These young people shared something in common. They were part of the rebirth of an Irish identity that in turn would lead to the assertion of Ireland's national aspirations. This outlook would create tension between generations. It is well documented that this was particularly pertinent to Sean Tracy's aunt, Mary Ann Alice. But Sean Tracy had a great intellect. He was analytical, he was quiet, he was considered, and he was thoughtful in his approach, whether it was to his studies, his farm work, or activities related to republicanism. A great deal, Sean Tracy possessed the love his native language and was a keen Gaelic League affiliate. He was also sworn into the Irish Republican Brotherhood and became an active member of the Irish Volunteers. He would emerge as a natural leader who led from the front and this became apparent at Easter 1916 as he travelled around the area urging action in support of the Rising in Dublin. No action occurred and it was a bitter experience for him John Tracy vowed the Tipperary would be front and centre of any renewal and hostilities and dedicated himself to that cause. John Tracy proved to be an able organiser and through his personality weaved a vital network that would staunchly support and sustain their future war efforts. Arrested and 
imprisoned for leading an honor guard for Eamon de Valera in 1917. John Tracy, while in Mountjoy, went on hunger strike and was forcibly fed. His comrade Thomas Aish died. This would have a profound effect on him. And after a second spell in Dundalk jail, John Tracy vowed to never go back to prison. His life hence would be that of the guerrilla fighter. In this period, he also met the love of his life, May Quigley. Later, they were engaged to be married and had set the date for the end of October 1920. And sadly, this was never to be. In 1918, John Tracy was elected Vice OC of the 3rd Temporary Brigade, along with Seamus Robinson, Dan Breen and Morris Crowe. They made up the 1st Brigade staff. John Tracy would hold this position until his death. John Tracy was resourceful. He was an inventor, especially in the use of explosives. He showed great initiative, even in the heat of battle, like when he suggested using empty bottles to propel paraffin across the route at Rear Cross Barracks. He was an architect of guerrilla warfare, putting theory into practice. Experience was the teacher, and he was a willing pupil, and he learned on the job. He also felt that the RIC was the primary barrier to them achieving their goals of an Irish Republic, and so would concentrate a lot of their efforts combating this force. He was also a deeply religious man, but yet he reconciled his conscience with partaking in armed action and the consequences that entailed. Not once did he hesitate in using his weapons in the cause of the Republic, and he was often the last to leave the danger zone ensuring that his comrades escaped. John Tracy was a loyal friend and comrade that could garner respect and admiration from those around him. He had an easy way, yet at the same time held people to the highest of standards. His sense of humor and dry wit were remembered by contemporaries. The nerves of battle were often tempered by Sean Tracy's presence. His comrades knew they could count on him. And to use a modern term, John Tracy was cool, calm and collected, especially when it mattered. There are countless stories of him intervening at crucial moments, spanning Salahed Beg, the rescue of Sean Hogan at Knock Long, at Rear Cross, at Ula, at Black Castle, Burnside, and indeed at the final fight in Talbot Street. He was under no illusions the fight would not be easy. Famously, he said the struggle would last 100 years. John Tracy also knew the Republic needed to herald tangible change. Ernie O'Malley recorded their thoughts. We knew where our sympathies were with the labourer and small farmer in the country and the workers in the city. Their struggle was for the Irish people. So just after 4 p.m. on Thursday, the 14th of October, 1920, John Tracy made his way by bicycle to Talbot Street in the heart of Dublin. He was a man on a mission, and despite a massive British manhunt, he was still determined to ensure that his comrade, Dan Breen, who was then injured in the Matter Hospital, would be rescued from a raiding party. Both men had a miraculous escape a few nights previous, when a safe house they were sleeping in was surrounded by enemy forces. Following an intense firefight, the two IRA officers, against overwhelming odds, bravely broke through the cordon and made a clean getaway. The British were left reeling. Their resolve to catch their Sean Tracy and Dan Breen would be relentless over the coming days. It was a cold and wet day, and stopping short of his destination, the Republican Outfitter store. He parked his bicycle outside the premises of IAS Farian. The street was crowded, and John Tracy had a quick glance around. He had been getting followed by enemy agents all day. Mingling with people on the busy thoroughfare, he used the crowd as cover to reach his destination. He quickly went into the shop. Inside, he met Dublin Brigade OC Dick McKee, Joe Vaez. Leo Henderson and Sean Ford. Plans were afoot for the rescue attempt at the Matter Hospital. McKee shouted, Raid, get out. 
as two lorries full of British troops and an armoured car pulled up outside. Intelligence officers had been watching the shop, and now that their target, John Tracy, arrived, their plan of action commenced. John Tracy quickly, yet calmly, left the shop and tried to mount a bicycle that was outside the outfitter store. Initially, he stumbled. It was not his own bicycle, and it was too big for him. He got his balance and set off. An intelligence officer called Sergeant Christian jumped from a lorry and pointed towards Sean Tracy, shouting that he was their man. Only getting a few yards, Sean Tracy was not from the bicycle. He was now grappling with Sergeant Christian. Freeing his weapon, Sean Tracy opened fire at two further intelligence officers, driving them back momentarily. He then shot Christian in the stomach. Two other intelligence officers opened fire on Tracy. He answered, heading one called Lieutenant Price, who fell on the pavement. As John Tracy turned to run, he was shot in the back of the head at close range by the other officer. Seeing the damage inflicted by Tracy, the military personnel panicked and heedless of the safety of their own men or civilians, opened fire indiscriminately with rifles and machine gun bursts from the armoured car. Absolute chaos reigned. The panic-stricken people were running in all directions. They were screaming and shouting. When the gunfire ceased, the air was heavy with smoke, and it soon became apparent that there were other casualties. A local shopkeeper called Joseph Corringham and a 15-year-old messenger boy called Patrick Carroll were both killed, while many others were injured. John Tracy, the indomitable brave fighter and soldier of the Irish Republic, died as he had lived, fighting. And according to IRA volunteer Sean Brunswick, he was a witness of the fight. He gallantly fought till death. In the coming days, Sean Tracy was taken home. His funeral was one of the largest ever seen in Tipperary. And despite a massive British military presence, thousands of people came to pay their respects. His tricolour draped coffin was brought to Kelfico for burial, and Brigade Officer Con Maloney gave a brief oration, stating that John Tracy is dead. His death is a great blow to us and to Ireland, but his loss must not unnerve us. Rather, it must strengthen our resolve to continue on the path he opened for us, to strive for the ideals for which he gave his life, and if necessary, to die fighting as John did. A volley of shots was fired over the grave and a final salute by his IRA comrade. In conclusion, I will um, I will repeat the words of third brigade of third brigade member Seamus Babington, who wrote of John Tracy that he was the hero of a hundred battles, a man whom every volunteer in the brigade adored, the man who inspired us, who gave us courage, and to whom we look for a lead. John Tracy's early death cast a shadow of gloom all over Ireland, but in his native county, especially in the third brigade area, where he was universally adored and respected, a black cloud of gloom settled. However, to make up for his loss, IRA activity was resumed with 100% frequency, boldness, daring, and an all-out effort to show that all was not lost by the death of our great leader. So a massive Guramila Mayogov to everyone for joining us tonight. We have many contributors who will be paying tribute to Sean Tracy, honouring, respecting and celebrating his life on the 100th anniversary of his death. Let us be inspired by Sean Tracy <coughs> to live the ideals that he died for. First day past our son, Saoirse Nahara. Thanks a million, Dan, for a brilliant speech there. Uh, it's a great point about remembering our heroes as well. I can't see the very critics telling us who we shouldn't remember if they will themselves be remembered 100 years from now. So great point. Uh, we would like to welcome Mary Kinane, who is a cousin on the Sean Tracy side, who is 95 years old, who's here tonight. We'd also like to welcome Tracy Hogan, who is a grandson of Sean Hogan, who is here tonight. Now, lots of us couldn't get to Tabas Street due to restrictions with the lockdown, but some of us did. So now we're going to look and show you a three minute video of the replaying event 
which took place on the 100th anniversary in the location where Sean Tracy died in Talbot Street. To ask, uh, we're going to lay a wreath here uh, in the memory of Sean Tracy. Those wreaths will be taken from the street and they will be brought to his grave side in Clifical County Tipperary. We sincerely appreciate those of you that have brought the wreaths in and the first read is going to be played uh, by the, from the people of Finglas by um, Mr. Jerry Buckley from the National Graves Association. So, Jerry. Uh, that that read is from the Liam Mellows Memorial Committee and the people of Finglas. And I want to thank them for coming in. Thank you very much, Sherry. The second read uh, is going to be laid by Mr. Noel Tynan. Uh, on behalf of Kathy uh, Lally, the families of John Tracy and Tracy family, which none of them will be here today because of the war. So I'm there on their behalf. Uh, this read uh, this is on behalf of Kathleen. Cleary, who is a relative of Sean Tracy, and that this read is laid. She couldn't be here today, uh, as many of her friends couldn't be here, had to be present. But that read will be taken to his graveside, and I think it'll be one more read. Yeah. And this read is on behalf of the National Graves Association. And I want to thank them for, indeed, uh, kindly remembering the event. So, it leaves little more for me to add, except a big thank you for those people that uh, organized this event. It's not what we had planned. It's certainly not what we would have liked to, uh, uh, to do, because we had a much bigger and a much more extravagant commemoration plan. But please God, next year, we can give due honor uh, to this wonderful man, uh, Sean Tracy, and pay the respects that he deserved, and indeed have a memorial uh, to his life, uh, indeed, have him remembered in stone in this locality, in this district, where he should be remembered. We remember them, our heroes in songs, but it's not enough. We should remember them, perpetuate their memories in stone. And I want to see a stone, indeed, memory of the great young man, uh, Sean Tracy. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me. And uh, And we saw Derek Warfield there giving the honours there to Sean Tracy as well. Okay, it's lovely to see this event happen on Talbot Street. Uh, next up, we have Paddy Dwyer, and Paddy Dwyer has been singing Tipperary so far away for many years in Solo Hebeg, Kilfico, and Dublin's Talbot Street. Seen by so many as a great tip man, and he hasn't disappointed tonight. Here's a three-minute video of Paddy Dwyer singing Tipperary's unofficial anthem, or official, Tipperary so far away. The sun has set with its golden rays And the bitter fight was o'er Our brave boys sleep beneath the clay On this earth they are no more The moon shone down the battlefield Where a dying rebel lay his body was stretched and his arms crossed as his life's blood flowed away. Her comrades in silent ambush lay, though the evening sky was clear. And not a man was there afraid, those brave boys knew no fear. Few people in the city streets had heard of the terrible fray of a gallant youth whose home was set 
in Tipperary, far away. A comrade passing had him moan as he wounded lay on the ground. The friend knew well he was one of his own as he warily looked around. Lift me gently, he whispered, no more on this earth will I stay. I will never more roam to my own native home or temporary far away. A lock of my hair I pray you take to the mother I love so dear. I implore you take it to her for my sake, for I know she'll think fondly of me. Tell her here in the battle for life at the dawn of bright freedom's day. I prayed for my home in the thick of the fight and Tipperary far away. <clears throat> A comrade passing had him moan as he wounded lay on the ground. This friend knew well he was one of his own as he warily looked around. Lift me gently, he whispered, no more on this earth will I stay. I will never more roam to my own native home or Tipperary far away. The comrades of Ireland bore him high on their shoulders with solemn tread. And many the tear and the mournful sigh wept o'er our patriot dead. In silence they lowered him into the clay, there to rest till the reckoning day. Sean Tracy he died, his home to save, and Tipperary far away. Sean Tracy he died, his home to save, and Tipperary far away. <laughs> I think that was a beautiful version by Paddy Dwyer and uh, I filmed him on Talbot Street singing it too and it's great that he keeps singing this song and remembering Sean Tracy in this way. Uh, next up we have Derek Warfield. Derek Warfield is one of Ireland's musical giants. His musical career has spanned since the 1960s with Wolf Tones and also the Young Wolf Tones where he has thrilled audiences both young and old the world over. He's a real lover of Irish history, particularly Tipperary history, and has been regularly performing every Friday night with the Young Wolf Tones on Facebook too. You can check them out every Friday. The song Come Out You Black and Tans was also made famous the world over at the start of 2020, you might remember. And Derek will be giving us a 10 minute speech and sing the Galti Mountain Boy at the end. Derek, you're very, very welcome tonight. Derek here. Have we got Derek Neve? I can't see him. Do you want me to come back? Yeah, no, I'm just trying to unmute Derek at the moment. Can't see him. Yeah, we might well, come I'll just, back. I'll just go ahead and move on to the next person and come back then after then, so. Okay, so um, we're going to look now um, at a retling um, video in Tipperary and um, I you think that's very, very important. Oh, Derek, you're in? Yes, yeah. So very, very welcome. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Technical issues, but we got around it. And um, well done for everything you did on Talbot Street. Um, if you'd like to give your speech, you're very, very welcome tonight. Well, I think I, I can add to very little what Daniel Jack just said about his life. Um, but I, I would like to comment on probably something that I know best of, and that is how we memorialize our our, our patriotic figures in, in, in songs. It's a very important part. I, I had a very good friend um, who's a, an archeologist and an anthropologist, uh, Charles Orser. And some years ago in the 90s, uh, the 1990s, he, he excavated the uh, mud cabins down in County Roscommon. And, uh, and a big project, he revealed the articles that they left behind in hundreds of mud cabins that had been uh, torn down and the people evicted from them. 
Now, the only uh, objects that he found were small little pieces of uh, cutlery and a couple of uh, um, pipes. But he said the only other thing that they left behind was the songs and music. And uh, that we re could reveal their feelings and how they lived and their attitude to the day-to-day uh, -day living. And so the songs are very important and they perhaps were the only means where we could pay tribute uh, to our heroes and our patriotic figures in the past. And that's why they're so important to the Irish people. Uh, I think uh, we don't realize in this country, in Ireland, of just how important they were in days gone by. Because if you read the literature in the popular press about events of the 19th century or even go back to the 18th century, they don't reflect the, the will of the people. They don't reflect the feelings of the people. So we're left with a, um, we're left with a history that is, is very selective. And that is, you know, we're, we're still living with the legacy of colonialism in Ireland. We're still living with it, the, the, the histories that are being presented uh, to that, that won't, it, it won't look logically at the events and issues that happened in the past in a way if they reflected in today's uh, Ireland. So it's a complex, uh, it's a complex thing for, for me to talk about because and if you understand our songs, embrace every aspect, indeed, of Irish history. Uh, they, uh, every episode in our social, political, and sporting life has been expressed through the songs. And in many ways, the, the songs uh, and the ballads have carried our history through generations. Uh, and so, Sean Tracy, because he was such an iconic and, uh, and a young man, uh, he captured the imagination, not, uh, not just of uh, Tipperary people, but of a broader audience around the world. And so did all the men of that generation, Terence McSweeney, uh, uh, that all of those men captured the imagination because of their passion and their belief in Irish freedom. I'm always, I'm always shocked by the, the conditions that they had to face. Uh, the horror and the destitution that was everywhere in Ireland over the 19th century. So it would have been easy for any patriotic figure uh, to take up and uh, take the actions that they, those young men did. And their lives, the lives of all of those men reflect one thing, that they, they believe that the Irish people uh, deserve better uh, than the, the horrors that were part of English rule in the 19th century. And I, I said in Talbot Street when I was speaking, if you look at the Irish representatives uh, that went to Westminster, Dan O'Connell, uh, Isaac Butt, Charles Stuart Parnell, they were all humiliated. And I quoted the words of that great Irish patriot, William James McNevin. Uh, he was a, a doctor and, and he's considered today the father of American chemistry. And he said, the, rep the public representative of the smallest fishing village in England would have more political clout at West Westminster than the entire body of Irish MPs. And it's a powerful statement. He said, only a fool would sit in Westminster in the, in, in the hope that the interests of Ireland would be considered. And to look at the lives of all of the men who signed the proclamation that Kevin Brennan read, the life of James Connolly, they all have one thing in common, and that is to change the conditions of, uh, of and the humiliation that those men of peace suffered. Parnell, Isaac Butt, and Dan O'Connell. And I suppose in many ways that's the way I've seen the life of Sean Tracy. He was one of many of the young men that indeed wanted to do something about the conditions of our country. And he joined the IRB and he met a lot of like-minded people. Okay. And uh, you're gonna sing a song tonight, I believe, is that correct? Yes, I, I'm going to sing a song. Um, 
I suppose in Tipperary, there are so many songs. Uh, I mean, I'd probably, there are songs from every county in Ireland, and I've always believed that the, the, the traditions of Ireland are as varied as the accents of the people. <laughs> and we all have our own little way of expression uh, in when it comes to music. And in Tipperary, there's such, you have, you've had such wonderful poets and uh, such great songs. And uh, I was lovely to hear the words of that man singing, John Tracy. And it's interesting that the, there are so many verses and the way a song changes through the generations and through the decades. And people want to express for their, 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 their tribute to the event or to the man. So uh, in many ways, the, the songs reveal the true feelings of, of how ordinary people felt about the event. Now I thought about it and I said to Niamh, I'll sing a song and we was the Valley of Sleeping and Warm was discussed and I will the gay Galti Mountains, but I ended up uh, choosing the uh, Galti Mountain Boy, which of course embraces all of the, the men who fought and the great temporary men and of course, I won't forget the many men from Cork as well and from every other county, but it's a wonderful song. And just like the ballad of John Tracy, what's more important is that Tipperary people have sung them down through the years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, when I, when I down in Tipperary, I always, uh, when I go to, when I go to Kilfeekle, I pass by Bansha, and I always think of Darby Ryan and his Peter and the goat. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the satire was a big part of our, our tradition in, in, in singing. So it's, it's like this, our, our songs are a mirror image of our heritage and tradition. They follow the Irish people all over the world, no matter where we've gone, they, we brought our music with us and the music enriched the communities into which they went to live. And I'm sure tonight, uh, this song, like the Gouty Mountain Boys will be sung somewhere else in the world. And so will the Ballad of Sean Tracy and their fitting memorials. And as I said, there are the only way we could remember our heroes. And I would like to see a statue of Sean Tracy in, in, in Talbot Street or in a location that's close by to it. So I'll end it there. And thanks, Marcus. And thanks for having me part of this tribute uh, to the wonderful, indeed, courageous and dedicated young man. Thanks very much, Derek. Really appreciate it. Yeah.
really moving I can guarantee you you would have got some round of applause for that if we were all there with you right now um so Derek Warfield and the Young Wolf Tones that was everybody and make sure to check them out on Facebook and have done so much in terms of remembering our Irish history I really really were in his death I think Derek and the Young Wolf Tones um next we're going to look at a very special wreath laying event in Tipperary at the 100th anniversary of Sean Tracy's death so it's important to remember him from where he was. So away we go there, Neef. I'm originally from Doon, but my mother was first cousin of Sean Tracy, so she went to school from here because her mother died when she was young. So she came down, her two aunts lived here at the time. And um, so we had uh, a good connection with the, the place. We're delighted that you're all here. You're very welcome. And uh, great, we have we have a good day for it. And um, so will I leave me here at the door? The front door, yeah. 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 That was Kathleen Cleary. Um, laying a wreath there at Sean Tracy's um, place of his home of residence. Um, I think it's very important to remember him in Tipperary too. I, I think it's it's brilliant to see Kathleen, uh, you know, being to the fore doing this. Um, okay, so next up, we have got uh, Sean Nugent. Sean Nugent is from Kilsheelan, Kilcash in South Tipperary. He's the former chairman of Tipperary County GAA board and son of the late Jim Gunner Nugent, who was the commandant of the flying column of the Third Tipperary Brigade, Old IRA. Uh, Sean Nugent will be speaking about the GAA connection to Sean for the next seven minutes. And in the best words of Gay Byrne, roll it there, Roisin. Thank you, Neve. Sean Tracy was born in 1895, 11 years after the founding of the GAA in 1884. He would have missed the great wave of enthusiasm that spread throughout Ireland after the new organization led by First President Maurice Stavin from Caic and Shore and Michael Cusick from Carron and Clare got off the ground. Michael Cusick said after the founding in 1884 that the GA spread around the country like a prairie fire, while Monsignor J.B. Dollar, great poet and historian from Moonkine and Kilkenny, said it made old men feel young again. He no doubt had an impact on all age groups in Irish society, but his greatest impact had to be among young people who up till then had no organised sporting activity that they were allowed to participate in. Sean Tracy might have missed that great surge of early support for the GEA, but as he grew up in the rural area of Salahed Beg, he would have become aware of what the GEA stood for, the promotion of Irish identity and the revival of the traditional native games of hurling football and handball, with a particular emphasis on athletics and the revival of the Irish language. One of the greatest things about the founding of the GA was the model of organising it on a parish basis. This ensured that in time that the association found its way into every parish in Ireland and it recognised no borders except those of parish, county and province. The parish concept promoted huge rivalries, a sense of place, a sense of identity and a love of country. There is no doubt that Sean Tracy subscribed to all that the GA was about and has imbued as the spirit of the GA to an early age and his involvement with friends and comrades in the GA and the elite league was to shape the great freedom fighter he was to become as he grew from boy to man. 
It is well known that the GA and the nationalist movement enjoyed a close relationship during the many struggles for our freedom. The GA opposed conscription, and in the wake of the 1916 rising, many GA members were interned in various locations by the British. There were members of the GA and the GPO at Pollock Pierce in 1916, most notably the great Dublin player Frank Bock, who served time in a Welsh prison for his activities. He was later to mark to praise Michael Hogan on that fateful day called Bloody Sunday in 1920. While there was huge support from GA members for the fight for freedom, the then hierarchy of the GA kept a low profile for obvious reasons of reprisals. There was, that was to change, however, in 1918, when the British decided that a permit would be required to play GA games. The GA decided that no club was to apply for a permit, and on August the 4th, a game would be staged in every Gaelic count in Ireland. The GA knew that the RIC or the British Army would not have sufficient personnel to stop the games, and this is what happened. They disrupted the games in a few places, but failed miserably overall. A Camogie team arranged to play a game in Cork Park, but a party of black and tans blocked the entrance. The girls were not to be heard on, however, and they played the game up and down Jones Road instead. This was the day they called Gaelic Sunday, the day GA took on the mighty British Empire and won. To play what to the fore in holding games throughout the county, and they were supported by men like Sean Tracy, Dan Breen, Dean Lacey, and many others who were to take a prominent part in the fight for freedom. <clears throat> there is no evidence to suggest that Sean Tracy took an active part in the GA as a player or an organiser of events, but he was a member and his loyalty lay with the GA and with other organisations who are promoted, promoting Irish identity and culture. It would have been extremely difficult for him to have an active role in the GA when one takes into account the level of work and involvement he had in organising various aspects of the fight for Irish freedom. He did, of course, get huge support from members of the GA who were comrades in arms with him on many engagements with the enemy. They also provided valuable intelligence to him through their networks of contacts in the GEA. We in the GA, however, owe him a huge debt of gratitude for the role he played with many others in ensuring that we today have the freedom to play and to enjoy our games and promote our culture in a spirit of peace and harmony. Which on Tracy's funeral took place from Salahed to Kilfekel, it was probably the biggest funeral ever seen in Tipperary. There were people there from all walks of life, and the GA throughout the county and beyond were heavily represented. Seamus Leahy, a nephew of the great Paddy and Johnny Lee of the great hurling family of Tubbardora, recalls a story he was told about the funeral. A group of hurlers, many of them county players of the time, cycled from Boholan to Kilfekel to the funeral, led by Paddy Lee. On the way home, they were confronted with a roadblock manned by British soldiers. Expecting reprisals, they were surprised at the response from the officer in charge. The officer asked them where they were coming from. Had he said the funeral of Sean Tracy, the officer said, you have buried a brave man today, go on your way. Even they recognised his greatness. Sean Tracy will never be forgotten by the GA and particularly by the Prairie GA. We are proud to say that the minor hurling trophy played for throughout the county is named after Sean Tracy and that at least four clubs at home and abroad bear his name. We have one Sean Tracy club situated in the Hollyford Kilcommon area. There is a Sean Tracy club in Lurgan, one in London and one in San Francisco. The great tradition began when Tipperary reached the All-Ireland Hurling Final of 1922, which was played on the 9th of September 1923 in Croke Park. Johnny Lee from Tomodora, who was captain of the Tiberi team, led his men on foot from Houston Station to Talbot Street, where they stood in silent prayer on the spot where Sean Tracy died before going on to Croke Park to play the All-Ireland, which they unfortunately on that day lost to Kilkenny. That great tradition has continued down the years, and more recent times was organised by the late John Hatt. The Council have gone in recent years and and in 2019, we stopped the traffic completely in Talbot Street for nearly an hour to pay honour and respect to one of our own, Sean Tracy. The occasion was honoured by the fact that the year Oakton of Common Lutla Squail, Egon or Ferril, gave an outstanding oration, followed by inspiring songs from Derek Warfield. We went with a pep in our step 
and the spirit of Sean Tracy behind us on to Croke Park to win the All-Ireland final, beating Kilkenny in the process. That tradition will continue while there are temporary men and women to wear the blue and gold jersey, and that will be forever. That's a great speech by Sean, okay. And what we're going to look at next is a little bit of music. Uh, Finbar English is their violinist for the special event this evening. Um, Sean Tracy's relation, Kathleen Cleary, presented Sean Tracy's violin to Brew Baru Culture Centre, which is at the foot of Cashel, and it's on public permanent display there. Uh, just she, Kathleen mentioned this, but I'll just introduce me again. Finbar joined a cultist branch to learn music. He heard the ballad of Sean Tracy. He took a great liking to the man. Uh, when he had returned to Ireland, he was educated in Rockwell College and lived in Kilfiku. He joined Baru Baru Cultural Centre and he was the first to play Sean Tracy's fiddle in the centre. He's travelled to China, Lebanon and the USA and extensively around the world with the group. And he's here tonight to play the ballad of Sean Tracy in a slow air and in another piece as well. So away we go. Hello everybody. Although we can't be together today, to celebrate and commemorate Sean Tracy, who fought and died for his freedom and the right to self-determination for the Irish people, I hope the ballad of Sean Tracy will ring loud and clear on his very own fiddle at Baru Baru, the foot of the Rock of Cashel. just how beautiful that was and even more haunting to think that it's from the violin that Sean Tracy used to play himself okay um so now we're going to have a discussion so we've got about 25 30 more minutes I'd say left all together okay so we're going to have about a 20 minute discussion and we're also then going to show maybe uh, two videos at the end uh, just to give you an idea in terms of proceedings so we're going to have a discussion with some real history heavyweights on who Sean Tracy was our esteemed panel this evening are Liz Gillis, Dan Jack, and Limo Donoghue. Uh, Limo Donoghue is a native of Hollyford. He's a retired school principal and teacher, a local historian. He now lives near Thurlis, and he's published books on GAA, on GAA themes. He's family connections with Sean Tracy and the O'Keeffe's of Glenock. And Liz Gillis is one of Ireland's best historians, having authored books on women of the Irish Revolution, Revolution in Dublin, the fall of Dublin and on the Hales brothers especially. She has worked as a curatorial uh, assistant in RTE and featured in a number of my documentaries on the Easter Rising Stories YouTube channel, including documentaries on Sean Tracy and the burning of the barracks in 1920. She's participated in numerous conferences focusing on the Irish Revolution and also developed the revolutionary walking tour of her native liberties. Liz is co-organizer of the annual conference on the burning of the Customs House in 1921. And we also have Dan Jack, who was our keynote speaker. So I'll just start off with Liam first. Liam, um, what was life like for the young Sean Tracy? Is Liam there? 
Me, have you got Liam on music? Or? Yeah. Are we okay there? Yeah. Where you go? Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm going to speak about the period of Sean Tracy's life up to 1916. As uh, was said already, he was born on the 14th of February, 1895, in Salahid Beg, and that his father had died just as uh, Sean was four years of age. So school days were starting around then. And we find in November 1900 at Holyford National School, the name John Tracy is enrolled there in the roll books. That's the school I attended myself. A book of around that time about County Tipperary was written by George Henry Bassett. It's called The Book of County Tipperary. And it, it describes Holyford as a village of 10 houses and famous for brown trout. He never mentioned the historic connections the area had with the retreat of O'Sullivan Bear or with Galloping Hogan and Cersei's famous ride to Balaniti. And within a few years, Holyford was one of the few places in Ireland that could state with certainty that one among them had fought in the 1916 rebellion in Dublin and also had a member in the first Doyle Aaron. I'm referring, of course, to Phil Shanahan from Fail Macduff in Holyford. According to the 1901 census, Sean was at the Alice home in Lacanacrina, where he lived with his uncle James Alice, Aunt Mary Ann, while his mother remained back in Salahid Beg. Walking to school in Holyford, Sean passed the barracks at least twice daily, the same barracks that he would be instrumental with others in burning in 1920. Sean's principal teacher in the school was James Lamb, who in fact was the owner of the barracks building at the time it was burnt and who claimed two and two and a half thousand pounds co compensation after the burning. Growing up in the farm in Lacknacrina, Sean being a bright, intelligent chap, did all the mundane farm work and helped around and wanted to be involved in everything. In the area of Holyford, their memories of the land war were very much alive during Sean's youth there. He would have known of Martin Lysett, the local poet, later postmaster in Holyford, who led the men of Upper Kilnamanna at the monster demonstration in Tipperary Town under a banner which read, to labor in defense of right for God and home to make a stand, to carry on the grand old fight for freedom, faith and fatherland. So support for the Fenian movement was very much alive in Holyford and most of the local obituaries in the press of the time mentioned Fenian sympathies, sentences like, the deceased was rare to the, to the Fenian tradition or a life steeped in the Fenian faith. In 1905, when Sean was 10, his uncle James, with whom he was living at the time, he got married. So now Sean and Aunt Mary returned to live at Salahed Beg with his mother. He had left Holyford, but it would always remain a special place for Sean, as he would in the hearts and minds of the people of Holyford. School days continued for him, but now it was in the old monastery in Tipperary town. Sean got some secondary education, which was unusual at the time. It was a time when virtually no one or very few had more than primary education. He had a good interest in reading. In the early days, historical books. In later times, military associated manuals. In 1909, we, found, we find out that he sat the junior grade at the CBS in Tip and passed on to middle grade. In 1914, Tracy was now 19. He attended a funeral of his cousin, William Alice, from Gortnacoola at Toome Churchyard. There was a big military display by the volunteers and the AOH. William Alice, who had been a member of the Fenians, and he was out in 67 and had campaigned for O'Donovan Rossa in the 1870s. William Alice was also on the square in Mitchellstown in 1887 during the plan of campaign when the police fired into a crowd that were protesting, killing three civilians and wounding many. On Alice's coffin that day was a remnant of the flag he had carried in Mitchestown all those years before. And all of this greatly influenced Sean Tracy. From his school days there in Tiptown, Sean had come to know 
the town like the back of his hand, the main streets, the lanes, the back alleys, all this would come useful to him later on. He would be familiar with the monument there on the main street, known as the Maid of Aaron, as he cycled to and fro every day. This didn't go unnoticed to Sean. This Manchester Martyrs Monument was erected in 1907 to commemorate the deaths of Alan Larkin and O'Brien. They had been executed in England for involving themselves in an attempt to rescue a Fenian prisoner. The Maid of Aaron Monument was unveiled just five days before the death of the celebrated Fenian and patriot John O'Leary, who was also a native of Tipperary Town. In his poem, W.B. Yeats, the poem September 1913, he laments the death of the great Fenian O'Leary with the line, Romantic Ireland is dead and gone, tis with O'Leary in the grave. The young Sean Tracy knew of Mullinahone's Charles J. Kickham, whose impressive monu monument on Main Street of his town was unveiled in 1898, and this influenced the young men and women of that generation as they read the immortal words carved on the monument, poet, novelist, and above all, patriot. Kickham's book, Knock Nagao, beloved of generations of Tipperary people, with the subtitle, The Homes of Tipperary, not the thrasher for the credit of the little village, all spelled out clearly how love of native place leading to love of country. As Chris Thoreau later wrote, no man will love his land or race who has no pride in his native place. Kick and sleeves them on to Prairie's anthem with such emotive lines as, O oh my land, will you never uprise and to see our flag unfurled or poems like Rory of the Hill and Patrick Sheehan. They were all familiar to Sean Tracy. The memory of the Fenian rising at Ballyhurst in 1867 was alive and well in Tracy's youth. J.J. Finnan remembered He's remembered as Miles, the poet, he recorded. It makes me sick to talk to you of those who agitate. Oh, give me but 10,000 men with rifles up to date. Then Saxon laws and Saxon rule may do their very worst to men behind the rifles like the men of Ballyhurst. And the following year, 1868, at Ballycohy, not too far at all from Solihead, just a couple of miles, the tenants resisted the hated landlord William Scully's notice to quit. The tenants revolted, refused to accept eviction notices. Scully was ambushed and again Miles with his poem about Ballycohy and Scully too was forced to yield. Despite of his protecting shield, they bore him bloody from the field, whoever saw him after. There were some courageous priests around at that time. Some were upstanding rather than bystanders. Among them was Father David Humphreys in Tipperary Town in 1889. The tenants of the local landlord, Arthur Smith Barry, were evicted for withholding their rents. In an act of defiance against landlordism and under the direction of Father Humphrey, they decided to build a new town outside Barry's control called New Tipperary, completed in 1890. Another major consequence of the Fenian rising in Tipperary was the decision to build a large military barracks in Tipperary town in 1874, there beside the railway station, which was seen by Sean Tracy as a blot on the Tipperary town landscape. He knew of the economic advantages of having such a major establishment with between four to 10,000 troops housed there during the Great War. He was also aware of the negative influences of a garrison town. Sean Tracy would also have seen plenty of evidence of the horrors and brutality of the Great War as the Tipperary barracks housed many of the casualties who were brought there for recuperation and rehabilitation. And as Eric Bogle put it, the wounded, the crippled, the maimed, the insane were all to be seen in the town of Tipperary in those years. Ironically, the site of that Tipperary military barracks is today the local GA grounds and named Sean Tracy Park. Wouldn't he have loved it? In 1914, the Irish Volunteers branch was founded in Tiptown by Sean McDiarmada. Also in those years, 
Sean Tracy was beginning to show a great interest in the Irish language. He had changed his name by now from John to Sean and regularly attended Gaelic League Conor na Gaelga classes in Tipperary Town, coming under the influence of Antahir Matt, that's the famous Father Matt Ryan of Nakavilla, and Eamon O'Dear of Balloch and others. This was a cultural baptism for Sean, a new beginning, a new vibrant identity. These classes developed into conversation and topics more than the price of turnips or the recent hurling match, more than the mundane stuff and into teasing out how to progress the national question. The Gaelic League's influence on Sean and others at that time cannot be overestimated. He became quite adept at spoken and written Irish, which shows his sheer determination when he took on a challenge. Easter 1916 for Sean Tracy, now aged 21, was a very disappointing year as he did and he did more than most to activate their plans for action in Tipperary but between the confusion of the countermanding orders very little happened. Tracy is recalled in one of the military statements as saying they're out in Dublin but there's not a fire on the Galtys. These were as I see it many of the influences that came together to mould the man we fondly remember today. A man of strong will and fierce determination, possessing excellent leadership skills. Like many of that era, he unselfishly set forth on a mission to better the lives of the people of Ireland. As he wrote from Dundalk Jail in 1917 in a letter to his uncle Michael, I shall use all my energies in the future to further the cause of Irish freedom in the best way I can. Or as Padraig Pierce put it, the Hugus Moganoish er on roads shall roam, er in Ganev the Chim, is er on boss the Yod. Dormian Magad. Thank you very much, Liam. Great speech. Um, Liz, um, I want to ask you two questions. Uh, first question is what was Sean Tracy's impact up in Dublin when he went there? Uh, it was huge. Um, the, they were immediately felt, uh, the presence of the Big Four was immediately felt in Dublin and they came up as a result of uh, having to go on the run from uh, TIFF after the not long uh, rescue of Sean Hogan. Um, and they threw in their lot with the squad um, with Michael Collins's group of assassins. Um, and amongst that group, you had men of similar qualities to Sean Tracy as in Dick McKay, um, he's obviously been the brigadier of the Dublin Brigade. Um, so he was involved in planning a lot of the operations that were taking place, both then in relation to the actual squad, men like Vinnie Bourne, um, James Slattery, uh, Patrick Daly and so on, men who were uh, doing, you know, uh, very, very dangerous activities as in carrying out the assassinations of uh, the G-men of the uh, Dublin Metropolitan Police. Um, when you look at the, the, the traits that Sean Tracy had, that Dan Breen had, James Robinson and Sean Hogan, these were experienced fighters. These men had actually proven themselves in the field um, from January 1919. Um, they weren't just, you know, sort of going out on their, their first operation. They had taken part in ambushes. They had actually killed men. So these were experienced fighters. So they were really, you know, um, a huge uh, benefit to the squad, which was only in its early days. And Sean Tracy himself um, took part in one of the assassinations of uh, the GMN. It was uh, Detective Johnny Barton. So they had uh, targeted the GMN uh, from late August, early September uh, 1919. Um, and there was a number of detectives shot um, and Johnny Barton, who was pretty notorious um, in his police duties um, as, as early as 1913, especially against members of the Irish Citizen Army. Um, he was very, very active. Um, he was warned to, to back off. He didn't. Um, and he was shot as he was uh, making his way towards uh, what's now uh, Pier Street Police Station. And he was... He was shot, but as he went down, he fired a shot and then he was fatally wounded uh, reputedly by 
Sean Tracy. Um, the other engagements that take place are that, that they are involved in. Um, there are big ones up in Dublin. Um, you have, of course, the attempted ambush on Lord French at Ashtown. Um, anywhere you find a squad uh, been in operation, you would find Stanbury and Sean Tracy um, somewhere on the periphery. They were experienced fighters. They were men that got the job done and were not afraid to, to get in and do what was needed to, to be done. Even though you have certain members of the general headquarters staff in Dublin not want them anywhere near Dublin, um, and Richard Mulcahy would be the, the, the main example, but the likes of Collins, Dickie Key, and so on, were, were quite happy to have the likes of Sean Tracy, an experienced fighter, um, on their side and being with his men um, and being involved in the activities that needs to be carried out. Okay. Um, one thing that's interesting is that, uh, you know, we Lee mentioned there about, you know, Sean's early influences, but who were Sean's influences, like, let's say, maybe even 1916? Did he have any? Yeah, there, there's a uh, one that I that sort of jumped out at me, um, and I only realised uh, this week or last week when I was researching um it, 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 for it, the talk I was doing about ballads of the Irish Revolution, and it's in the camps. And you now I'll try and make any connection between Fourth Battalion, which is where I live, um, of the Brigade, the IRA, and you know anywhere, Cork, Tip, whatever. But um. Emma Kant wrote a, a marching song for the volunteers, um, Ireland overall. Now, Emma Kant in 1916, very, very similar in, in traits to Sean Tracy, as in he wouldn't ask a man to do something that he wasn't himself prepared to do. And in 1916, when he is meant to be commanding his men in uh, the South Dublin Union, Emma Kant was burrowing through the walls. You know, he was, he was there in the action, in the thick of it. Um, and that's what you find Sean Tracy himself did. Um, he, he would not ask a man to do something that he himself was not prepared to do and he proved that uh, you know, on the 14th of October um, but when Sean was imprisoned and the, the families from uh, or the letters from his family where they're, they're you know, trying to say that Dan Brain was a terrible influence on Sean and Sean is being led there was no way anyone could leave Sean Tracy to do anything he was the leader but in one of the letters home he, he quotes that song he quotes those three words Ireland overall and it was only when I read it I was like oh my god this is he obviously had to have a, a, a huge influence very similar uh, men um, and just the fact that he puts those three little words because that's some Sean Tracy up those three little words just sum them up completely and nothing else needs to be said when if you want to describe Sean Tracy it is those three words um, Dan alluded to it earlier um, I think Thomas Sash was a huge influence on him because if you look at Thomas Ash and what he did in 1916, adopting the guerrilla tactics that were used so well um, in the War of Independence. But Sean Tracy was in Mount Joy with Thomas Ash at the time of the hunger strike. He was on hunger strike with Thomas Ash and he witnessed Thomas Ash die for Ireland. Um, so I think if if someone was going to maybe take inspiration and see what the ultimate sacrifice could be and meant, if they're going to fight for Ireland, this is the actual cost. Are you prepared for that? Um, Sean Tracy, just like Thomas Ash, it was a different way that he died. They're prepared to do that for the freedom of Ireland. So I think those two men who you probably wouldn't necessarily think would, would be an inspiration, I honestly do think that they were two big influences on, on Sean Tracy and the way he carried himself and his determination to do anything to free Ireland, to put Ireland overall. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dan, uh, you have just written a book uh, with Neve Hassis. Uh, can you tell me what you've written or what the title of it is and why you decided to write a book on Sean Tracy now? Uh, well, the, the book came about by accident. Uh, more by accident than design. We were hoping to do a, a small booklet for the 100th anniversary event. And when Neve and I started doing our research, um, we started uncovering uh, quite a lot of material related to Sean Tracy. So we were searching through the archives and, and we felt that um, 
there was another side of Sean Tracy there. Um, as I mentioned in, in the previous talk, uh, we, we remember Sean Tracy as the, as the great guerrilla fighter. But it was very apparent reading the, the witness statements and even pension applications, the huge personality that was that John Tracy was uh, and the huge impact that he had on um, the people that he came into contact with. And so we, we decided to call our book Searching for Sean and we actually put out an appeal in, um, in some of the local press in Tipperary for family stories and connections to Sean Tracy. And we got some, some fantastic um, material for, from that. Um, we came across so much um, stuff in the archives as well. We, we actually got so much that the booklet turned into a book. So we dropped the let from the, from the title. Um, so we, we found quite a bit on, on Sean Tracy. Um, we, we'd obviously, there, Desmond Ryan had, had written the book back in the, the 1940s, so there was a lot of material there, but so much has came to light since then. And um, we actually found correspondence Sean Tracy had written to GHQ in the aftermath of the barracks attacks. So when we speak about the barracks attacks, we always use the likes of Ernie O'Malley's accounts or, or different accounts that were written maybe many years after the event. But these, uh, these correspondence that we uncovered from Sean Tracy was written maybe hours or at least days after the, the attacks. And there's no gloss. So they weren't written for, for, for literary reasons. They were written as a, as a functional uh, report to their general headquarters. And then that John Tracy speaks about um, mistakes that they made or things that they would do differently the, the next time um, as well. So it, it just shows the, the, the mind that, that John Tracy possessed, that he was constantly striving for, for improvement. But the thing that changed out the most for me was just how um, our great, our greatest, uh, and our great esteem, Sean Tracy was held by everyone that it, that he came into contact with, and it's from the, the the ordinary volunteer through to people that that sheltered them. Um, James Robinson was always amazed at, at Sean Tracy having contacts all over the place, um, as well. So, Sean, we wanted to uncover a wee bit of Sean Tracy's personality as well and, and, and that comes out in the book as well as his, his military prowess and also the fact that he, 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 was, he was someone who was a great comrade who was there till the end even in his final fight in Talbot Street. He, there was a, an IRA report and we were kindly given a, a handwritten copy of it. It was actually done by Dick McKee himself and he concludes by saying that every action of Sean Tracy on that day was deliberate right to the end. Um, so so that, for me, that's what comes out in the book is, is just a little of Sean Tracy's personality of who he was and the esteem in which he was held in. Okay, okay, thanks very much. Now, just because of time, I'm just going to go on to um, the Dominic Fian slideshow. I'm going to show you a video then at the end after that, but I just want to say um, it's brilliant to see so many of you that are tuning in tonight and really really thank you so much because I think this is very important this is a hundred anniversary I mean how many of these are we going to have you know um, so we're going to feature a slideshow with Dominic Behan the famous singer with his famous song Sean Tracy in the background so if you want to give it a go there Neve. Give me a parabellum and a couple of hundred shells. Lead me to the Muldar gang, we'll blow them all to hell. For just to die, I have them sigh. 
how to raise a met defeat. Our lovely Sean is a dead and gone, shut down in a Talbot Street. They took the front and they took the back. They were all around the place, waiting for the war to take to set the house ablaze. Yet how those English soldiers pale went out into the night. Sean sent a stream of lead and hail, challenging them. Come on, he cried, come show your hand, you've boasted for a salon. How you could crunch my lovely land, with your army great and strong. Come show this metal which you say, and make the whole world real. And ere there dawns another day. I'll show Tipperary steel. He fought them off as best he could, outnumbered ten to one. He spilt a bath of English blood before his race was run. No surrender was his cry. And ever no retreat, said Tracy Bry before he died, shut down in a Talbot Street. Okay, it's a very moving song that. Now we're just about to finish up with one more song before we finish, but I just wanted to say for me, um, thanks to everybody involved and thanks for coming. Extra special thanks to Neve Hassett and Lee Sullivan. One of the things that is vital in terms of remembering our history is to remember it after the centenary event. The 101st is as important as the 100th event because you wanted to continue. And Tipperary was blessed with the historian John Hassett, who had the foresight to interview participants in these events. He wasn't waiting on the 50th or the 100th. He just did it because it was the right thing to do. And what we need to do is bring the younger generation to these events to continue the tradition of Irish people who are proud of their heroes, heritage and culture. There's a famous saying, they thought they had buried us. They, they didn't know we were seeds. The next generation will need to up their game, commemorating Sean Tracy and those who fought alongside him. To those watching this years from now, remember, we did this during a pandemic. Uh, so we're going to close the event with a video of the immediate aftermath of the shooting of Sean Tracy. The music is performed by Saivo Flynn and I knew it would work very well over the footage. You can be the judge of that. We look forward to meeting you in person in future commemoration events. I'll certainly see some of you at the 101st. Thank you very much for tonight, guys. Over to you, Neve.
thank you very much everybody and um, hope to see you at the 101st and thanks for joining in okay for me good night